Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Elaine. She is a member of the 2012 Master Gardener class. Uh, her primary interest is in sustainable gardening. She actually created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are now a very popular resource on our website. Uh, she has spent the years since becoming a master gardener photographing native plants in both private and public gardens, and she uses her uh, photo library to illustrate her talks and all her posts on uh, social media. In addition, she serves as one of the coordinators of the Get Glen Carlin demonstration gardens in Arlington, so if you visit, you could meet up with her there. And our presentation today is creating a well-layered landscape. Elaine. Thank you so much, Colleen. Welcome everyone. Today's presentation has actually been uh, over a year in the preparation stages. I created it uh, in response to feedback I got from many of the other talks I've given on native plants. And from those listeners, I learned that they were excited about native plants, but wanted a little more information about how to combine them in a complete native landscape. So today I won't be providing as many details about the plants themselves, but trying to convey information about how to uh, create uh, integrated systems. So you will have more than just collections of plants. And I'm going to use the concept of well-layered gardens to address both your desire to have um, aesthetically appealing gardens, but gardens that will also benefit the environment and support our local wildlife. We'll begin with a quick review of some sustainable landscaping principles and then move directly into several landscaping scenarios, establishing layered forest edges, adding layers around lawn trees, refreshing foundation plantings, creating layered perennial beds, and rethinking your front yards. Uh, you'll see the two logos R and P to the side. On slides that have an R, that will be referring you to the uh, two-page resource handout that I provided. So there's a lot more background information you can get on certain topics. Uh, slides that have a P will refer you to, uh, I think it's a three page plant list. And many of those plants actually have links to the tried and true fact sheets that Colleen was referring to. And as she mentioned, Cheryl will be putting a lot of helpful information in the chat box as we move along. So let's begin talking first about sustainable landscaping principles. One of the first things you should do is to identify and remove invasive plants from your property. Unfortunately, as attractive as they may be in our individual gardens, they can move beyond via seeds and fruits to our native areas, our natural areas, and there they will really overtake uh, out, out compete our native plants. One example right now is the calorie pear, which you see in bloom uh, as a monoculture up and down highways uh, along much of the East Coast. Plants like uh, Asian wisteria and English ivy are reaching up and smothering our tree canopy. And these ground covers, popular ground covers, and shrubs can be found both at the big box stores and still available at nurseries. Uh, on your resource sheet, you will see some links to information on our Master Gardener of Northern Virginia website. Uh, they will tell you which plants are considered to be invasive in Arlington, Alexandria, and beyond. Uh, some suggestions on how to control them. And I created a, a video which you might want to refer to on native plants and, in, uh, excuse me, invasive plants and native alternatives. Another sustainable practice is to think of ways to reduce your lawn. The mowed lawn is really the default feature of most home landscapes. And unfortunately, it consumes a lot of our time, 
our money, precious resources such as water, and may involve use of many chemicals. Now, many of us find a, a need for a lawn. We have pets, we have children, we may do various recreational activities. But you may find, as I did, that you can reduce the amount of lawn over time. And you could consider replacing it with mulched areas or a hardscape for socializing. And you could greatly inc increase the number of plants you use in your garden and simply use grass as a path between beds or as a framing device around the beds. You might consider turf grass alternatives. One possibility is the no-mo fescue seed mix. And this is a combination of uh, creeping and bunch forming fescues. And they're going to interlock to form a dense sod. It's low maintenance, drought tolerant. It withstands a moderate foot traffic and will inhibit weed growth. It grows in full sun to part shade. At its full height, it's about six inches high. And you could actually just let it simply bend over and it will create a soft meadow effect as you see here. This particular uh, blend grows well north of 30, 37 degrees latitude, which is around Roanoke and Richmond, Virginia. So up in Arlington, Fairfax County, Prince William County, uh, we're at 38.7 to 0.9 degrees latitude. And any of you visiting from further north, this might be a, a usable alternative for you. A native alternative would be poverty oat grass, Danthonia spicata. This is um, a delicate bunching grass. It's a cool season grass that grows well in sun and dry soil. It reaches only about four inches in height, so it's not going to re uh, require mowing throughout the season. And you could simply uh, trim it back to give it a fresh coat uh, at the end of the, of the winter. It is, is very drought tolerant. For those of you who have dry shade where you find that turf grass isn't growing, you might consider introducing Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. This is, has a fountaining habit, but it spreads to form its own kind of, of turf via rhizomes and uh, will be very attractive there. Uh, it doesn't take much in the way of foot traffic, so you would need to introduce stepping stones as your way to pass through that area, but it eventually could fill in as a nice ground cover. And you'll find a detailed information about that no-mo fescue and uh, the other plants on your resource and plant handouts. You might also want to consider some other turf grass alternatives. Some non-native possibilities would be mini clover and creeping thyme. You could do as Cheryl does, which is to allow native violets to volunteer in your yard as a ground cover. Another native possibility is wild strawberry. And those are also discussed on the resource sheet. Studies by uh, entomologist Doug Tallamy, his graduate student Desiree Narongo of the University of Delaware, and Peter Mera of the Smithsonian Migratory Bird System uh, Center, they conducted a study in 2013 to 14 in the DC metropolitan area. And they were comparing home landscapes and discovered that landscapes with the greatest percentage of native plants, especially trees, would support more caterpillars. This is important because the caterpillars of our native butterflies and moths are important food sources for our bird populations. 96% of our birds rely on this soft, easy to digest food to feed their young. And they may feed them as many as 9,000 caterpillars during the period of, of their growth in the, the nest. And so they discovered that the uh, ideal landscape had 70% native biomass. But this means that that would allow you 30% of benign non-native species, all of your traditional favorites to continue using in your garden. Some other advantages of native plants, 
they are adapted well to our local growing conditions, the water systems, the climate, the soil. So they're likely to do well once they're established. They provide a distinctive sense of place. Our forests, our meadows are going to be different from those in other parts of the country and certainly different from the forests of the Northwest or the, the deserts of the Southwest. Very importantly, native plants have co-evolved with our local fauna. They're going to provide nectar and pollen for pollinators. As I just discussed uh, in that uh, study, they serve as the so-called larval hosts for the caterpillars of our Lepidoptera. Native plants offer food, cover, and nesting materials to wildlife. And luckily they possess uh, desirable ornamental qualities and there are numerous species to choose from. Appropriate native plants uh, for us in Virginia, we're lucky because uh, we're at the southern end of the mid-Atlantic species and the northern end of the southeastern species. Virginia is divided into three eco-regions, the coastal plain to the east, Piedmont in the middle, and the mountain region to the west. And we are located along the fall line. So therefore we can take advantage of plants from both the coastal plain and the Piedmont regions. And this just shows where we are locally. Now, many of the plants that I'll be discussing are actually native up through the mid-Atlantic, even some of them for the entire East Coast. It's always important to opt for the so-called straight species of native plants over the cultivars. If there has been a change of leaf color from the natural green, which has uh, chlorophyll, to red or purple, which contains anthocyanins, this modifies the chemistry and affects the use of the plant as a host plant for those Lepidoptera. If there are large showy blossoms, there will be fewer fertile flowers. And if extra petals have been added, for example, as in the center of this purple cone flower, replacing that central cone, there will be reduced nectaries, completely uh, removing the opportunities for seeking nectar and pollen. Now, many of us, because we have smaller yards, may decide to use dwarf species, smaller species of native plants. Uh, Generally, that may be acceptable, but there have been some questions on modifications of plant height and especially berry size when you're looking to uh, provide support for our native birds. They may not recognize those plants as the ones that they would normally be seeking. Another thing to note about the cultivars is the great majority of them are propagated clonally by uh, cuttings, and they lack the genetic variation to make them more adaptable. Uh, there are some resources on this topic. I wrote an article called Making Wise Plant Choices, where I discuss uh, Doug Tellamy's studies, additional studies of herbaceous plants by Annie White, and you may also want to refer to the Mount Cuba Center plant trials on cultivars. And of course, you'll want to keep in mind this best management practice, our master gardener's mantra, right plant, right place. That means you want to match a plant's requirements to sun, soil, moisture conditions. It's a good idea to do a soil test to determine pH because some plants are very particular as to soil acidity or alkalinity. And finally, you'll always want to allow appropriate room for a plant to grow. Uh, talking more specifically about layers, the topic of our conversation today, these layers are going to create pleasing structure visually while supporting the interconnected ecosystems. And I really enjoy this slide uh, to the right done by the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia. Uh, this is just illustrating the use of various layers in our garden for birds, but this could be true of, of wildlife in general. Uh, so they'll be using layers from the canopy all the way down to the ground. And I particularly want to call to your attention this range of 5 to 15 feet, which is the nesting height for most birds. And as you're adding plants to each of those layers, you would want to include multiple species within each layer. 
it's also important to keep in mind the layers below ground. You see the circle in red, the very short root growth of our turf grass compared to the roots of our native grasses and some selected herbaceous plants. And some of our native plants can have roots uh, five to eight feet deep and more. This is going to help uh, prevent erosion of our soil. It's going to make those plants more drought tolerant. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we move along. You'll also want to think about creating layers through the seasons. This is important because there are peak ecological values to our gardens at different times. For example, with the spring blooming trees and early uh, wildflowers, they'll be offering nectar and pollen to those early emerging insects. You'll want to provide support for our Lepidoptera from host plants through the spring and summer months as various generations are produced. Don't forget late season pollen and nectar for the insects before they go back into hibernation. It's important to have fall fruit for our migrating bird species and seeds and cover are important for a variety of animals through the winter. And of course, there'll be changes in our gardens over time. Plants are damaged and may die and bring about changes. We gain knowledge, our tastes and attitudes change. Here's my garden in 2010 and a different look in 2021. So moving on to the main topic, we're adding layers to our home landscapes. I'm going to be presenting what I consider a toolbox of various techniques that you might use. Depending on the size of your garden, you could use all of them, you could use only one or two, a combination. It, it's up to you, whatever would work best for your particular situation. So uh, along the back of your property, you might want to establish some forest edges. If you don't have room for that, but maybe just uh, a lawn tree, you could always add benefit by creating layers around that tree. You might be interested in refreshing your foundation plantings with more native plants in layers. You could create a layered perennial bed. And finally, we'll be helping you talk about some ways to rethink your front yard designs. Now, an alert, I am not a landscape designer, but I have been planting native plants in my own property, which is about a quarter of an acre and multiple master gardener demonstration gardens for about 20 years. So I'm hoping to be able to share some helpful information from my own use of these plants and of some examples from uh, some other master gardeners. So let's begin looking first at establishing layered forest edges. Our original natural landscape was what's referred to as the Eastern deciduous forest. This was um, a mix of trees such as oaks, maples, birches, and various conifers. And we traditionally in our area have four distinct seasons and up until recently at least a fairly even distribution of rainfall. And these forests are always composed of four layers. The canopy, which has the mature uh, dominant species for the forest, understory, which is uh, shorter trees, a shrub layer, and finally the forest floor. Now, when we speak about forests, they are actually subdivided into smaller uh, natural plant communities. Plants don't just occur randomly. They occur, they, they grow together, and they this occurs because they have certain preferences. Some of them may look for a certain uh, location on a slope. They may have certain characteristics in common as far as their preferences for soil, the type, the pH, the fertility, the exposure to sun or availability of moisture. So on your resource handout, you'll see three links. One will take you to uh, a resource from the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, one to Natural Ecological Communities of Northern Virginia. And those are very helpful, but they're quite complex. And I found personally the most helpful resource was the Native Plant Compendium that was put together by uh, Matt Bright of Earth Sangha. Now, 
Earth Sangha is a volunteer organization that's looking to help uh, conserve our natural areas. But this uh, compendium is so well written and focused on uh, home landscapes. I think you'll find it very helpful. It goes into a great deal of detail and the plant list that I've sent will list all of the plants. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on them, but I just want to show you what some of these plant communities look like. The first is the acidic oak hickory forest. This is common in the Piedmont and fall line region. And it's generally found on drier slopes with less fertile and drier soil. So you might want to introduce this uh, if you have those conditions to create a buffer uh, if you're along a forest edge, or you might create layers be beneath an existing specimen canopy tree. And those canopy trees, the oaks are shown on the side there, and other species that are considered indicative of this particular forest community are the hickory and flowering dogwood. So here are the canopy trees, the oaks, uh, quite tall, and they are outstanding as far as support for wildlife. They, uh, the Quercus genus supports over 500 species of Lepidoptera, as well as many other uh, wildlife. Uh, two other canopy trees are the mockernut hickory, which has uh, compound leaves, these nuts in husks and a lovely golden fall color and black gum, this is sylvatica. This is a dioecious tree. That means that you'll see separate flowers on male and female trees and the fruit on female trees in the fall, brilliant fall foliage color. Our Virginia state tree, the flowering dogwood is the dominant understory tree, but you'll also see American holly, it, an evergreen tree with the beautiful fruit on the female plants and a tree that isn't uh, used as much as I think people should is the American hornbeam, Carpinus caroliniana. It has a very pleasing rounded form, nutlets uh, as food and a very interesting fluted bark. Further down in the understory, you'll find these shrubs, deerberry and mountain laurel. These are so-called ericaceous plants. They're in the heath family and they do well in uh, this acidic soil lovely flowers and fruit on the vaccinium. Other understory shrubs are the maple leaf viburnum, which is the most shade tolerant of our native viburnums, and pinkster bloom azalea with its lovely fragrant flowers. Both of these shrubs do what's called suckering. They will send up additional shoots, additional branches from the base, and they can naturalize to form a colony, uh, helping to fill out that understory layer. And then in the ground layer, uh, two dominant plants will be Christmas fern and Virginia creeper. Two herbaceous plants in that ground layer are Solomon's seal with its lovely arching stems of dangling flowers and blue stemmed goldenrod, a spreading plant. This is going to be a great pollen source for our insects in the later part of the year. Uh, a second native plant community that's uh, very common in Northern Virginia is the mesic mixed hardwood forest. This will be found more in low elevation habitats in both the coastal plain and the outer Piedmont. And this uh, has a moderate amount of moisture. That's what the term mesic refers to. And for this one, again, you could create a buffer at the edge of your property, or you could actually add layers replanting under an existing tulip tree. The beech, the tulip poplar are the predominant canopy species in this plant community, and spice bush and mayapple are other indicator species. Here are the canopy trees, the uh, American beech with its beautiful silvery gray bark. It has very attractive quilted foliage, and you'll see it uh, there in the picture on the left, uh, the lingering golden brown foliage. The other uh, canopy tree is the tulip poplar with its uh, distinctive columnar form. It has copious nectar in its flowers and a lovely golden fall color. In the understory, you'll find these plants, spice bush, another dioecious plant with uh, very nutritious fall droops, 
pawpaw, which can either be found as a short trunked tree or a multi stem shrub. It has these distinctive spring flowers and large fruits. Moving into the ground layer, this, as I mentioned, is a more fertile soil. So you'll see quite a few early spring ephemerals, such as the toothwort, spring beauty, and the bellwort, as well as the uh, dominant may apple. Uh, also Christmas fern, and then in the fall, white wood aster will be blooming and going to seed. So I'd like to give you a couple of examples of how you could take this concept of forest communities and uh, make use of that in your own home landscapes. And the first is what I did, which was, was to create forest layers completely from scratch. My garden was a pancake flat, very little in, in the way of vegetation. So back in 2002, I had some landscapers bring in a number of trees. At this point, I knew nothing about native uh, plant communities. Uh, I was just beginning to learn about native plants. So not all of the plants that they introduced were native. Luckily, two of the pines were the sweet gum, uh, the tulip poplars, and a dogwood I brought in from um, my neighbor's uh, garden. Then moving ahead, uh, eight years, you can see how the sweet gum grew substantially. And in fact, that entire area of my backyard is completely shaded in. Now I ended up removing the plum tree, which was non-native and the Eastern red bud had unfortunately been planted too close to the house. It was growing up into the gutters. It did not have an attractive form. And so I removed that as well. But you can see that although I introduced that canopy layer, I still had a, a lot of work to do to introduce the understory. So I've continued to do that. Moving ahead to 2020, you'll see the witch hazel, the pines, and the sweet gum that I put in with that initial planting. I've added a sassafras tree, which is um, a lower and understory tree. And sweet shrub is just one of the uh, shrubs I added. Then moving across the back, here's the sweet shrub again. Here's where that flowering dogwood was placed against the fence. And I decided to bring an, in another tall uh, member of the cornice genus, gray dogwood, to help fill in that uh, understory layer. Then closer to the ground, I have golden alexander and white wood aster. And on the other side of that stepping stone path, under my uh, canopy trees, tulip poplar and red maple, I have spice bush and pinkster bloom azalea as my shrubs. Marginal wood fern and wild columbine are among the herbaceous plants, and golden ragwort is covering the ground floor. I've also taken advantage of volunteering violets. I've introduced more shrubs like this native viburnum, uh, introduced very attractive specimen plants, and many native grasses. And I discovered, interestingly, many years after starting this whole process, that the plants that did the best were actually those that are members of that mesic mixed hardwood community. Uh, I'm moving next to an example of a good friend and fellow master gardener, Alyssa. She had a, a completely different situation. When she moved into her property in 2007, she had quite a few uh, trees as you see here, but there was very little in the way of understory. The, uh, that ground layer was completely covered by invasive English ivy and oriental bittersweet. So it took her a year or so of consistent work to remove those invasive vines. And she had to go back repeatedly. Each time she might remove about 80%, some would regrow. And over time, she was able to, to remove that pretty successfully. Although she does alert people that you need to remain vigilant. Her next step was to actually go about identifying the mature trees that she had. And she discovered that her trees are actually species characteristic of the acidic oak hickory community. So she uh, identified those mature trees and allowed young trees such as that pignut hickory to grow. Then she discovered that she had some new volunteers, an eastern red bud, 
and she went out and added some additional native trees, a pagoda dogwood and pawpaw. And she also retained snags. These are uh, dead trees that can still provide habitat for uh, our wildlife. Now, a very important step uh, for her to do uh, in restoring the forest layers was to quickly find a way to control erosion. She had removed all of these invasive vines and she needed to introduce ground level plants. Now, at this point, she was beginning to be interested in native plants, but at that time, they were sometimes difficult to find and there wasn't always accurate information about which plants were native and which ones weren't. So she, she did the best she could, but she found that some of the plants were actually non-native. An additional step that she took was to allow some native herbaceous plants to actually grow, emerge from the seed bank. They had been suppressed by those invasive vines. And now, uh, as of last year, you'll see all these beautiful native herbaceous species that she's added. Uh, foam flower, phlox and wild ginger uh, can spread as ground covers. Wild columbine is a taller herbaceous plant. She has lovely ferns, lady fern and Christmas fern. And she's gone on to add uh, plants like oak leaf hydrangea. And here, this was a, a non-native uh, climbing hydrangea that wasn't going to bloom. And so she's taken that down and replaced that with the native Virginia creeper at the base of that tree. So here's a look at uh, some of the mature specimens and some of the smaller trees. And she's gone about over the years, adding and substituting shrubs, coral berry, spice bush, Virginia sweet spire, and sweet pepper bush. Uh, they're, although they're not pictured here, she's also added arrowwood viburnum, black haw, and wild hydrangea. And here you have a, a lovely short video showing uh, the use of her property. Uh, she and her husband are very interested in, in birds. Her husband is a well-known birder. And you can just see the, the activity of those birds flying through her garden. And on the left, you'll see all the lovely wildflowers, ferns, and sedges that she's introduced to help restore that lowest of the for forest layers. If some of you have the challenge of trying to introduce fo forest layers on slopes, I have a few suggestions from another master gardener, Alex. She handled this by introducing terracing, and she used a combination of fallen branches and boards, and then some uh, core logs, they're shown here, not in her yard, but just to let you see what they look like uh, to help control erosion on the slope. Then she grew a mix of ground covers and shrubs. Uh, as I mentioned, it's important to have plants that are going to be reaching to different root depths to help uh, keep the soil in place. And then she installed shredded bark paths that were parallel to the slope and then installed steps to safely descend the slope. If you don't have room to introduce all of these species at once, you may want to start with what uh, Matt Bright in that compendium refers to as the generalist species for woodlands. And you'll see information on these on um, both your resource and plant handouts. We've already talked about the, the white and red oak as being so important in, and in uh, the forest communities, and, and they do well in a, in a range of situations. Black cherry is also another very important uh, keystone plant for supporting Lepidoptera. River birch tends to do better in wet circumstances, while red maple is very important as far as providing early pollen and nectar. It tends to be overused. And our foresters recommend that if you can come up with another plant, because it is so prevalent in our canopy, it might be good to introduce a different species. I mentioned the uh, attractive American hornbeam, and of course there's uh, the familiar flowering dogwood. Other possibilities would be the American hazelnut tree, these native viburnums, and beautiful strawberry bush. When you are creating these forest layers, 
it's really important to let them function as a forest. And that means retaining the fallen leaves under the trees. This is going to serve as a protective covering for the exposed earth. It will help recycle nutrients back to the trees and, and other plants. And the disintegration of those leaves over time, that organic matter will help build soil. Maintaining the leaf layer is also important for the protection of the larval stages of some of our insects, fireflies and the Lepidoptera. This can be a great time savings. You may just simply need to rake leaves away from any remaining lawn, from your paths, and also it will re reduce the cost of buying mulch. And then my second recommendation is to hold off on your spring cleanup. The plants in that lower layer are generally going to be able to emerge through the leaf litter and then holding off until the warmer spring weather will allow time for those burrowing native insects to also emerge. Let's move on to our second uh, example, which is adding layers under trees. It's important to of course, avoid the invasive ground covers. You don't want to restrict the roots of your trees with borders or paved paths right next to them. Here's some examples of uh, proper mulching, which is a step in the right direction. In this uh, landscape, the tree was properly mulched with just several inches of mulch, allowing the root flare of the tree to be exposed. Here, there's mulching all the way to the edges of the drip line. And in this example, two trees were joined with mulch, but we can actually take this uh, a step further. Here's an example where some shrubs have been added to create uh, quite a large bed between some trees. And then we can move on to add lower plant layers that will actually serve as a green mulch. You can add bulbs and spring ephemerals, low growing perennials, as I did around a tree in my front yard, I have wild stone crop. Uh, autumn fern is not native, but I have Christmas fern and marginal wood fern. And one of my all purpose favorite ground covers is Allegheny spurge. It's just beginning to flower with the mottled look to the leaves right now, and then they will turn green. And you'll see information on these plants on the plant handout. Here's just a few examples that I photographed around my neighborhood. Some folks have used evergreen shrubs. At the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden, we've used shrubs with multi-season interest. Uh, the, the tall oak leaf, uh, vib <coughs> oak leaf hydrangea with its blooms and then uh, winterberry with its lovely fruit. Here's some small shrubs and perennials. And in this large rain garden, there's a combination of shrubs, grasses, and perennials surrounding the central river, uh, river birch tree. In my yard, uh, I introduced a black gum, and this actually was brought in by EcoAction Arlington, a local environmental group, to replace uh, a dead invasive tree. So my shrubs, the arrowwood uh, viburnum, were actually fairly mature at the time that the tree was installed. Uh, I then went on to add Eastern Blue Star. It's an herbaceous plant, but it has a shrubby type habit. And then I have these non-native ground covers. I was not happy with this uh, very aggressive ground cover. So I've uh, planned to introduce these lower growing uh, plants, these native ones. Uh, for that ground level, the snow flurry heath aster, sun drops, dwarf blazing star, and lyre leaf sage. And these are mentioned on your plant handout. And just a few important tips for planting under trees. You'll want to choose plants that are fairly drought tolerant because they're going to be competing with the roots of the plant for water. You'll want to consider the mature height of the plants if the branches of your trees are fairly low growing. You want to disturb the tree roots as minimally as possible. And you can do that by using small container plants or plugs. When you introduce the plants, you can mulch around them and water your new transplants. But eventually, those are going to be spreading out, and you won't have the need to be continuing, 
uh, continually uh, re-adding the leaf or bark mulch. And those tips uh, are mentioned uh, on your resource handout. There's uh, information on planting under trees, and you might want to refer to a video that I created that's on our uh, Master Gardener website on native ground covers for sun and shade to help you create that under layer. Moving on to our third landscaping option, refreshing foundation plantings. This is what uh, traditional fountain foundation plantings often look like. They may be rigidly arranged, often rigidly pruned, and most frequently with invasive species. And even when they're benign, such as these Asian uh, azaleas, they're of minimal value to wildlife and really only have one principal season of interest. So some tips if you want to move toward creating uh, native foundation plantings. First of all, you want to, if you have some non-native shrubs, you're going to want to keep them in place before they can be removed um, and replaced completely in order to maintain cover for birds. As you begin introducing your native shrubs, you want to allow room for their mature size. And that means also retaining uh, adequate space next to your building so that you can maintain the, the foundation. And my uh, urging is that you prune only for the health of the plants retaining their natural form. Many people are interested in having evergreen plants in their foundation, so I thought I would introduce some native alternatives. You might consider arborvitae. Uh, the, the straight species can grow 30 to 40 feet, but there are cultivars that vary widely in height. And one popular uh, cultivar is this uh, DeGroot spire. A lovely uh, semi-evergreen native tree is Sweet Bay Magnolia with these fragrant blossoms and very attractive seeds. And these are mentioned on your plant handout. Moving to the height of evergreen shrubs, you might consider Yaupon holly, Ilex vomitoria. There are many cultivars. You see Shadows and Will Fleming pictured here. And this is Nana, which has a dense rounded uh, shape and it's uh, considerably shorter than the others. Gray owl juniper, the cultivar of our tall tree, uh, Eastern red cedar, is as a very attractive gray green foliage. It's uh, generally described as being about three feet in height. I've seen it maybe reaching even four feet, but it spreads quite wide, about six feet wide with its arching branches. And then there's always the lovely inkberry, our native evergreen holly, and I've just learned recently about gem box, a very petite uh, form of this shrub that you might use as a substitute for boxwood. Now, I don't have time to go into all of these lovely deciduous shrubs, but I'd like to refer you to a video I created, Overused Foundation Plants and Native Alternatives, where I go into a great deal of detail on those. And you'll also see links to fact sheets on your plant handout. Moving down to the lower layer of the foundation, here are some examples of lower growing woody plants. Maryland dwarf is a, a very short cultivar of American holly. Grow low fragrant sumac has this lovely fall foliage. And low scape mound black chokeberry has the same flowers and fruit as the taller straight species. And then in the lowest layer of your, found, of your foundation, you can introduce ferns, plants like Appalachian sedge and golden ragwort, wild ginger, the alum roots, and you can always rely on volunteering native violets. A few quick examples. This is from my friend, Wendy, uh, Wendy's garden. She's also a master gardener. She has the lovely, Sweet Bay Magnolia as her signature tree. Uh, it's bordered by the Burford Holly and Japanese Maple. And then in this view, you see the lovely Autumn Bride alum root. Then looking from the side, here's the Magnolia and the Holly again. She also, for the next layer, has oak leaf hydrangea. And then in the lowest layer, as a ground cover, she has Grow Low Fragrant Sumac. This is an example from my yard. 
uh, looking at it way back in 2010, I had this uh, azalea cultivar, a non-native, and these Asian hydrangeas all along the foundation. I replaced my lawn and completely uh, widened the, the bed to about 10 feet deep. Then looking ahead to last year, you see that same Asian, vib uh, excuse me, Asian azalea here. I introduced uh, pagoda dogwood. This is not the, um, the kusa dogwood, which you might think from that um, Asian sounding name, uh, its alternate name is uh, alternate leaf dogwood. That is the tallest of the plants in my foundation. And this is what it looks like in fruit. Uh, Black haw viburnum is uh, the tallest of the shrubs. Here it is in flower. Black chokeberry, strawberry bush is about four feet high. And then and, uh, that's shown here with its very attractive fruit. And then wild hydrangea, it can range anywhere from uh, three to five, he five feet in height. And those are the very attractive flowers that draw many, many pollinators. And then in the lower level to flesh it out, I have uh, the violets, sedges, and the Allegheny spurge. Moving on to our next uh, scenario, creating layered perennial beds. I recommend choosing a sunny location. This is going to be best because you, many of the pollinators are going to prefer the, those warmer uh, conditions. And you can either uh, create it along a sidewalk or a driveway. And it's particularly attractive when set against a background such as a, a fence or a line of hedges. And there's information, uh, for example, if you want to start a brand new bed uh, in an area that has been lawn, I'd like to refer you to a video by fellow master gardener, Becky Halby. It's called Grass to Garden, Creating a New Garden Space. And she talks about how a no-till method of how to suppress your lawn grass and then go about making a safe place to introduce your plants. Some important planting concepts for your perennial beds. You'll want to choose plants with a variety of flower shapes and a range of bloom times. These examples just in the yellow uh, plant color, like you can see have completely different shapes and different bloom times. And ideally, you'll aim to have at least three species blooming at any given time. Another good idea is to introduce the herbaceous keystone species. These are the ones that are going to serve as those important host plants that Doug Tellamy highlighted. And additionally, they will provide late season pollen and nectar. And those uh, most productive plants are plants in the Solidago genus, the golden rods, supporting 115 Lepidoptera, the asters, and the sunflowers. And as much as possible, additionally, try to find plants representing multiple families. This allows for best biodiversity because some of our insects are what are referred to as specialists and they will be drawn to only very specific plants. So if we want to support as many as we can, we provide as many plants as we can. Moving on to the concept of layering in this particular scenario, I refer you to this book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. It's written by Thomas Rainier, uh, a landscape designer from our local area, and Claudia West, a, a prominent plants woman. And they discuss this idea of planting in layers. So you'll first need to think about large, long-lived plants that are going to give the visual structure. In a sense, these will be serving as the bones of your planting. And those will be maybe about 10%, 10 to 15% of the plants. Most of the species you'll be choosing will be what they refer to as the seasonal theme layer. They're going to provide the color and the texture through the season, and they can range from 25 to 40%. But very importantly, you'll want to have a high percentage of the ground layer plants. These are, in a sense, the living mulch. They're going to act as a functional glue to cover the feet of the taller plants. Their roots may not be as deep. The, the roots of the others will be going deeper. But in a sense, they also will control erosion, and they certainly will suppress weeds. 
And as your bed is filling in, you might count on what they call filler plants, annuals, biennials, short-lived species that can be introduced until your choice plants will have completely uh, filled in. Just some quick uh, looks at the various types of plants. You can have shrubs and tall grasses as structural plants. You might use very tall perennials in the back of a bed, and you can rely on bushy perennials to give a lot of structure. Uh, this is one of my perennial beds that's a, a work in progress. And here you'll see the seasonal theme plants. I recommend that you plant in drifts uh, with about a three foot diameter. And it's also a good idea to plant in odd numbers, three, five, and seven are the recommendations of uh, landscape designers. And you can see examples of how I've done that here. Now the dwarf Baptisia has already bloomed. That was back in May. The aromatic aster in its cluster and the blue stem goldenrod will be coming along uh, later in the fall. A planting in drifts makes the plants much more visible to our pollinators and it's going to make pollination much easier. They won't have to be traveling such wide distances between plants. And then in your ground layer, there are many options. There are clumping plants like blue-eyed grass, little blue stem and purple love grass that will get wider at the base. There are mat forming plants that are fantastic for suppressing weeds. Uh, lyre leaf sage, sundrops and robin's plantain have basal leaves that will remain once the taller flower stalks have uh, died back. And there are also uh, spreading plants that will uh, help fill in. And a quick look at an example of my perennial beds. You'll see the list of the plants in the structural, seasonal, and ground layers. And where I've used asterisk, it shows the plants that are in bloom at any particular time. So here in April, these are my structural layer plants. These are the seasonal layer plants. At this point in time, it's only the eastern blue star, star that's in flower. Then here are some native ground layer plants that are in fact in bloom and the non-native ground covers. The dianthus is the one that's in bloom. Moving on into June, structural layer plants again, the inkberry and the arrowwood. And in fact, the arrowwood, it, you just see the lingering blossoms. It mainly it did its blooming in May. The Eastern Blue Star, which was the prominent plant in April, has finished blooming, but it still has a structural presence in the garden. And now beard tongue, lupin, and sundrops are the plants that are blooming and the ground layer plants are continuing on. Then later in June, this is looking at those double beds from a different angle. The oak leaf hydrangea by the front steps is in bloom and the arrowwood has moved on into its fruiting stage. Cup plant, which is only shown here as foliage, will gr actually grow to about eight or nine feet tall and be flowering a great uh, pollen and nectar source in uh, July and August. Then back in this uh, upper bed, Stokes Aster will be coming along shortly in June and July. And then these plants, the wreath goldenrod and sedum, will be great plants for wildlife support late summer to fall. And of course, there are abundant ground layer plants. And finally, this uh, photograph was actually taken just a few weeks ago. It shows you how my evergreen inkberry plants and the basal leaves of beard tongue and sundrops combine with all the ground layer plants to pretty much cover the entire surface of this bed throughout this season. And finally, I'd like to talk about how you might rethink your front yards. We're always, of course, concerned about curb appeal. What are the neighbors going to think? What are the restrictions of uh, homeowners associations? And traditionally, people see mown lawns with defined beds that have a lot of mulch as neat and orderly, and they're interpreted as being intentional and neighborly. But unfortunately, what looks good may not be supportive of our wildlife. So, Luckily for us, um, researcher in uh, the field of ecological design, Joan Nassar, uh, wrote a paper 
titled Messy Ecosystems and Orderly Frames. And she came up with this concept of cues to care for native landscapes. And the idea is that you can use certain design principles and maintenance techniques to make inclusion of native plants in your home landscapes culturally acceptable. So let's look at a few of those. You can uh, have a well-maintained streetscape with well-trimmed plants and unobstructed sidewalks. Make sure to have a clear view of walkways. Define paths and trails, preferably made of permeable materials. As we discussed earlier, you can use foundation plantings with native plants to provide structure. You can use walls and terracing to contain plantings. Those linear elements are going to bring a sense of visual order. Be sure to provide support for plants using fences, arbors, and trellising as uh, scaffolding so that they're not sprawling over the ground. You can use edging to frame your beds, hardscape such as stones or bricks, or you can use uh, short plants themselves. It's recommended that you use a high proportion of colorful flowers that's seen as an indication of human involvement. And you might also want to add these other indications of care for wildlife, such as uh, descriptive signage, water features, of uh, bird houses, bird baths and bird feeders, and uh, indications of care for your property, such as furniture and art. So let's look at a few case studies. This is the home of my friend, Wendy. And here's what her front yard looked like back in 1992. I'm sure with its uh, symmetrical trees and neatly trimmed lawn and hedges, it was seen as very neighborly. But as she learned more about native plants, she worked with a designer and put in a new landscape in 2007. And this is what it looks like now. I consider it a, an absolutely beautiful, welcoming, well-balanced landscape. And let's see how it's, uh, in a sense, ticking the boxes for uh, meeting those cues to care and the other important aspects of layering that we've talked about. You can see that it's got a well-maintained streetscape with defined paths. There are native foundation plantings to provide structure, and she has a greatly reduced lawn. In addition, she's used 70% native plants and they are arranged in multiple layers usable by wildlife. This is a view in early April. Here are the non-native plants. The tallest of the native plants in the front is her green hawthorn tree. These are the uh, native uh, shrub layer plants. Then she has a uh, wild geranium and hairy alum root, the autumn bride cultivar as her ground level, level plants. Moving on to late April, uh, the green hawthorn is in bloom, uh, a wonderful source of, of pollen and nectar. The nine bark uh, shrub will be coming along blooming fairly soon. The yucca will send up its attractive flower stalk in the summer and the cat mint will be coming along blooming before too long. And then on the right hand side of the slide, you see another portion of her front yard where she's introduced multiple layers of shrubs. Again, the echoing pattern of that uh, autumn bride as her ground layer. Then moving into October, uh, you still continue to see a lot of structure in the garden. The hawthorn tree is, has now gone to fruit with these palms. Uh, a very uh, appealing to wildlife, uh, switchgrass behind the tree, and the yucca continue to give an architectural presence. And those uh, fruits will remain uh, very attractive on into February. Uh, my second case study is uh, back visiting uh, Alyssa's yard. We've seen what she did in her backyard, and this is the front. Uh, this is what it looked like in 2020. And then she was able to work with a landscape designer. They brought in a mini clover paths to replace that lawn. 
She has a number of trees and in spring, you will uh, particularly see this lovely fringe tree. Uh, Blue wild indigo, Arkansas blue star are blooming. And then the field thistle will be coming along later uh, in the year. In summer, you see all of these native wildflowers are in bloom. And she, again, is using these cues to care and concern for uh, planting her native plants appropriately. She's used uh, an alternate lawn in defined paths. She's used edging to frame her beds. She has a very high proportion of colorful flowers, about 70% native plants, and again, arranged in multiple layers. Here's another look. Uh, it shows how she's using uh, ground covers, and in this case, herbaceous plants uh, next to her foundation. Here she's using virgin's bower and uh, trumpet honeysuckle. They're uh, incorporated as vines to create interesting vertical layers, but they are well-maintained. And she's also incorporated some edibles in her garden. So the use of terracing to contain the plantings plus providing support and indications of care such as the uh, edibles and the furniture uh, are just marks that this is a well-maintained property. Because of her strong interest in wildlife, she's introduced some special features for wildlife. Uh, that tree, the uh, fringe tree, of course, goes to fruit. She has herbaceous plants with seed. And she's also brought in bird feeders and a water source. And as you can see in the video, uh, even though the fringe tree is no longer in bloom nor in fruit, the numerous birds can be using that as a safe resting spot as they're waiting to have their turn either at the bird feeder or the water source. And a third example, I just found this very attractive, uh, modern, sophisticated landscape as I was visiting different neighborhoods in Arlington. I found out later this was actually designed by a professional landscaper, but it again shows these cues to care. It has a well-maintained streetscape with a defined path, a high percentage of native plants in multiple layers. And then looking from the side, you see how native foundation plants provide structure and the terracing contains plants. And here's just a few more quick examples uh, that I have found. I'm getting excited to discover that there are more homeowners who are deciding not to use lawn. They're planting in layers. They're introducing furniture, benches to indicate uh, care for their property. This uh, particular property, actually, uh, the homeowners were planting in their little hell strip on the other side of the sidewalk, but they are continuing to uh, keep a well-maintained streetscape. And just a few more quick examples, just showing you how you might just uh, introduce a few native plants here and there uh, to balance out what are basically at attractive landscapes with no lawn. Here, you can substitute native grasses for invasive grasses, maybe introduce just one native shrub, uh, fill in some of that bare soil with a spreading uh, ground cover. Again, replace an invasive grass and introduce some shrubs that maybe are going to be more inviting to wildlife. So, I hope with the various uh, examples from the toolbox that will give you some idea of how you could employ some of these in your own gardens. Uh, here's just a few further examples of uh, how individual these, these various front yards can look. Per your individual personality can definitely show through as you make your decisions. But all of these, the factors they have in common are those cues to care, the minimal use of uh, lawns, higher percentage of, of native plants that are maintained in layers. And finally, just a few comments on uh, some suggestions for inspiration. We invite you to visit our Master Gardener demonstration gardens. You can find the locations for those on the website and we'll be glad to welcome you. 
public gardens that I've enjoyed visiting that I found particularly illustrative of different uses of these uh, for home landscapes are the Nature Conservancy, a small pocket garden behind uh, the, the Nature Conservancy headquarters in Arlington, the outdoor regional garden at the US Botanic Garden, just uh, spectacular with plants of many types arranged uh, absolutely beautifully. Brookside Gardens has large meadow areas as well as forested areas. And for those who want to get good examples of how to create those forest edges, I recommend visiting the Potomac Valley Collection at Meadowlark Botanical Garden and Fern Valley at the US National Arboretum. And finally, uh, on your resource sheet, I provided some links to sites that have uh, actual garden designs, it, should you want to have further inspiration about particular combinations of native plants that you could use. In summary, I would like to say that uh, you should really take your time with, with this whole idea of creating these layered landscapes. Uh, on my property, I have no lawn. I, I have been able to employ each of the different scenarios that I've described, but I did this by breaking it down into very small projects, and I've done it over a period of about 20 years. So I welcome you to take any of these suggestions and apply them as they, as they fit your particular lawn, uh, garden situation. Um, and based on the, the time the, and the resources that you have at any given moment in time. Uh, another point to make is that uh, the cost can vary depending on whether you bring in uh, an outdoor landscape designer and how much work you have them do. I have not had any designs by professional landscapers. My highest cost came from the fact that I introduced uh, hardscape and I had very large, fairly large trees brought into my forested area. So they required a professional planting. But I urge you to look for opportunities. Uh, for example, this, uh, this black gum tree was introduced uh, by Eco Action Arlington, a group that a local group in Arlington that's looking to help us rebuild our tree canopy. And those trees are brought in for free and planted for free. You can look for plant sales that master gardeners have throughout the state. They can be good sources of native plants at reasonable prices and making use of the plant plugs that I mentioned for use around trees is a really economical way to, to get less expensive plants that will spread fairly quickly, but you can get higher percentages of those. As far as questions on maintenance, I'd recommend that the most important thing would be to maintain that leaf litter layer in the forested area and to really take seriously planting of a high percentage of the ground level, level plants in all of those other scenarios uh, around trees, in your foundation, and in the perennial beds. That is really going to suppress weeds and uh, reduce the amount of maintenance. So in summary, uh, be brave. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. I certainly have. And uh, enjoy the whole process of planting your native gardens. All right, uh, Colleen, I'm ready to take questions. Okay, you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go back to sort of the beginning of the presentation. There were a couple of questions about no mow fescue, uh, where to get it, what's, what it comprises, that kind of thing? Yes. Um, the, the resource which I provided uh, on your handout, it's uh, labeled on the very first sheet, no mow lawn fact sheet, was written by a horticulturalist who has been instrumental in developing that particular seed mix. And he goes into a great deal of detail about how to obtain it and how to plant it, uh, all, the, all the growing conditions, how you would maintain it. But just to recap really quickly, it's a blend 
of uh, both two different types of fescues, the, the creeping ones and the bunching ones. So they're going to join together to, to create that uh, turf simulation. It's um, because you could let it grow um, and just bend over slightly, or you could apparently mow it maybe just once or twice, but it's not going to require that constant mowing. Um, it, it's going to be much more sustainable. It's about six inches in height at its maximum. Um, and it grows north of this uh, 37 degree latitude. Wow, thank you. Um, Elaine, do you have any recommendations for grass use for a uh, wet area that has an underground spring or I guess any other plantings you would recommend for that situation? Okay. Um, I had thought when I was originally planning this talk that I could maybe go into talking about um, rain gardens. I could talk about uh, planting next to streams and there just wasn't time to, to include all of that. But um, in, when I prepare this addendum, I will include some links to really helpful resources on creating rain gardens. But uh, if you had a large enough space, you could do what I showed in one of those slides. You could have a tree like the native river birch, which is particularly suited. Willows are also well suited. To, uh, to those very moist conditions. You could have those in a central area. If you don't have room for a tree, you could have plants like, um, like Joe Pye, the Joe Pye weed, uh, ironweed, the lobelias, cardinal flower, and great blue lobelia as your tallest layer plants in the center of, of that rain garden. And then proceeding out to the, um, to the areas that are not quite as moist, you would use other lower, lower level plants. Um, some of the sedges are, are particularly good at absorbing water in that lower level, but I will share more information about that. Um, the, as far as grasses, um, a lot of our warm season grasses are going to prefer dry conditions. They are actually native, uh, to the uh, Midwestern tall grass prairie. They have very deep root systems and some of them will actually flop if they are grown in moist conditions. Examples of those would be little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium, um, switchgrass, Panicum virgatum, Indian grass, Sargastrum newtons. Those grasses are going to prefer dry conditions. Um, grasses like, um, Chasmanthium latifolium, the, uh, the river oats, um, Elemis hixtris, bottle brush grass might do better in, in those moisture conditions and they tend to, to take less, uh, less sun. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a question about the native Virginia creeper and if it's okay to let it climb trees, this person has a silver maple and um, wanted to know if that was harmful. Well, there have been different opinions about that. Mm -hmm. um, I gather from Alyssa that she is planning to, to allow it to grow up her tree. In, in the picture, it was the non-native plant that, that was actually growing, but she has planted it at the base of the tree. I've heard different opinions of, about that. It, because of the way that it, it adheres, it's not damaging the way uh, the English ivy is. It, mm -hmm. it, that is just going to really uh, suppress the, 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 the bark and be very, very hard to, to remove. It's so, it's so tenacious. But there have been some questions about uh, allowing too much of the Virginia creeper to grow up because the weight that it might add to the branches. So um, I've, in previous uh, talks, I've uh, provided some links to discussions on that and I can do that again in the addendum document. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for native peach or apple trees? Um, to my knowledge, those are, are usually non-native species, but our extension uh, agent, Kirsten Conrad, has some wonderful presentations you will find in the virtual classroom under the education menu tab, where she talks about uh, fruiting plants. The, the fruit, the native fruits that she discusses 
are um, plants like the uh, the vaccinium, the the blueberries, and and some and some of the other shrubs. Yeah, I think pawpaws too, maybe. Yeah, paw, pawpaws would definitely uh, yeah. be a good example. Thank you. Okay, um, someone uh, question uh, has may apple and other uh, spring ephemerals and wanted to know if you have recommendations for summer and fall ephemerals that will not outcompete with the may apple if they are planted together great question and i didn't show a close up slide of this a uh, part of the ground layer in in my forested area i have a number of spring ephemerals i have a Virginia bluebells, I have the may apple, and uh, the, the bluebells are just about to bloom right now. Uh, the may apple is coming along. Uh, the bluebells will be dying back sooner. The may apple lingers on, but what I've done is I've interplanted Allegheny spurge, the, the native Pachysandra procumbens, in between the may apple plants. It is uh, pretty much evergreen, uh, it, its leaves will get a little tattered in the winter, um, but it will send up new growth. And then as the May apple dies back, it will definitely have a presence. I've also interplanted with ferns. One of my favorites is um, the evergreen marginal fern. Uh, mm. That's um, Dryopteris marginalis. So those are a couple of examples of the plants that I've uh, interplanted with that will be very attractive, but won't suppress the, the, the spring ephemerals when they do come up. Wow, thank you, that's a great answer. Um, there were many, many questions on when it's okay to bring begin spring cleanup. Alyssa has weighed in on this and said it should be at least five days of 50 degree temperatures, and then it's okay to leave um, stalks um, that are pencil sized, uh, to grow to at least 12 inches. Um, would you agree with all that? I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> We're of, of the same mind. Uh, okay. Just to, to go uh, a little bit further, there have been uh, some recent studies that have indicated that insects may be emerging as late as April, May, and even into, into June but it, it may get to a point that we need to do a certain amount of cleanup. I, for example, have discovered that some of the, uh, the basal rosettes of plants were getting a little bit suppressed where leaves had blown into this front bed that you're seeing here. And I just needed to, to brush those uh, away somewhat. As far as keeping the stalks, um, what, you'll, what you'll do is actually uh, you will have kept them up, those larger stalks of native plants, you'll have kept them up over the winter. And if you trim them down to about 12 inches, they, they'll be uh, unsightly for a very short period of time. But then the new growth will come of, of those perennial plants will come up, completely cover those stalks and, and be very attractive. It's those older stalks, the ones from from the previous year that can then be used by uh, some of our native insects that, that like to, to use those as a hibernation location. A good percentage of our native insects, the native bees are ground dwelling, but, uh, but maintaining the stalks is um, important for, the, for those that like the cavity nesting. Okay, thank you. Um, one questioner was worried about removing liriope from the base of her tree, uh, concerned about injuring the roots. And as a second part of that question, wanted to know if there are any native liriopes. Liriope is a non-native plant. Uh, my favorite replacement for liriope is one of the native sedges. It's called plantain leaf sedge. Its uh, scientific name is Carex plantaginea, and it has a very similar habit. It has uh, leaves that are about an inch wide. They have a very interesting texture, kind of a crinkled texture. It's a uh, alternate common name is seersucker sedge because of that interesting texture. They are uh, 
pretty much semi evergreen. They are just now sending up the new fresh leaves. The inflorescences are very interesting on little, little um, stalks that have alternating maroon and lime green color. That's to my mind, a, a fabulous a replacement. Now, as far as getting it away from the roots of the tree, um, Alyssa is going to be giving a, a presentation next week on tips and tricks uh, from master gardeners. And this may be one of the topics she will discuss. I know she'll be mentioning uh, a tool that she and I favor, which is called the Hori Hori knife, H-O-R-I, H-O-R-I. And this is a tool that can allow you to, to pry very gently down. It has a serrated cutting edge, so you could really cut at the roots of, of that uh, liriope, which is called lily turf, and it's called that for a reason. The roots are very turf-like, they're very dense. But if you were to do that very gently, I think, I think you'd find that you could manage it. It's, it's going to be work. Um, I made the mistake of introducing both English ivy, um, the uh, periwinkle, and liriope at different points in my garden before I knew better. And it, it takes some work to remove it, but it's, it's definitely worth the effort. And um, the, Pakis, the uh, native Pachysandra would be another lovely ground cover under a tree. Okay, thanks. I just noticed I skipped one from earlier in your talk. Someone asked if the understory of a mesic forest could be used in an oak hickory forest. Could you swap things? Well, I would strongly recommend that you look to the very thorough discussion um, in that uh, plant native plant compendium on the Earth Sangha website. They, you can go directly from my resource handout to, to that website. It discusses exactly which plants are in which naturally occurring plant communities. But mm -hmm. as Matt pointed out, there are certain generalist species and our yards are not always large. We may have a limited amount of space and introducing even one or two uh, large plants to give that native biomass of 70% is, is better than, than nothing. So um, look to that site for, for uh, the fullest answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, there was someone who wondered if the uh, cultivars of the native evergreens are just as good at supporting birds and pollinators. Uh, I, I believe they are. And um, you, I, guess, I guess the Mount Cuba trials, to my knowledge, have mainly been for herbaceous plants. Uh, one of their most recent trials is for uh, Hydrain the native hydrangeas and, and all of the various cultivars. Um, but my understanding is that, especially if the, if the berries have not been changed uh, on those native shrubs, that they should still be beneficial. Okay. Um, someone asked if you had, if you would include Amsonia in any of your landscape plans. I did. Um, I didn't use it by the scientific name, but uh, I mentioned Amsonia several times. Um, in fact, on the back side of this planting right here, where the black gum is the uh, is the example of the of the tree, uh, these are the the native uh, arrowwood viburnum. Right here on the other side, I have a whole semicircle of Amsonia. Tabernay Montana. And I think I refer to that on your, on your plant list. Um, but you can definitely see that on our Master Gardener website. I've created a fact sheet on that. That's a lovely plant. It's herbaceous, but it has a very um, bushy structure. And, and so it, it, it does well as a, an architectural plant. It's just beginning to come up now. It has little purple tips to the, to the shoots. It's just coming up now, but by April, it will be three feet tall and it will be blooming. And it has absolutely spectacular blue flowers. Mm -hmm. That particular species, the Tabernay Montana, 
will turn a bright yellow. Its leaves are more um, linear uh, lance leaf uh, shape. Mm -hmm. The other Amsonia, Amsonia cubrictii, I pictured uh, where I was talking about bushy plants that, uh, that you could use for architectural structure. The Amsonia hubrichtii is not technically native here. It's native to Arkansas and Oklahoma, but it grows very well here. And it has a very feathery foliage that again, turns that brilliant color. It's just uh, very striking. And the flowers are again, blue and, and very similar to the Tabernay Montana uh, in the bloom time. Oh, wow, thank you. Um, someone commented that they love Mexican grass, but would you suggest a native substitute? Uh, the Mexican grass was pictured in the third of those front yard examples. Um, I have understood that in some parts of the country, it actually could be uh, problematic with, uh, with spread and aggressive growth. Um, so maybe, some of the shorter uh, cultivars of switchgrass are really attractive. Um, there's one that's, that's quite popular. And in fact, it's been introduced along uh, some major roadways in Arlington, Virginia. It's the Shenandoah cultivar of switchgrass, Panicum virgatum Shenandoah. It interestingly has um, a burgundy cast to the foliage in the fall. It will turn color. And Panicum virgatum has really attractive airy seed heads, uh, very open and, and distinctive. So that might be a nice substitute. Um, another one might be uh, pink muley grass. That's about three feet high. Mm -hmm. um, gorgeous, spectacular, uh, almost uh, haze, almost a pinkish purple haze. Um, Aragrass, that, that pink muley grass is, um, let's see, come on brain, uh, the, the, the scientific name for that, maybe Alyssa can put it in the chat. Um, and uh, Aragrastus spectabilis is a purple love grass. Oh, Muhlenbergia capillaris is the scientific name for the pink muley grass. And by the way, speaking of scientific names, I've made a point of giving on your plant list both the scientific and common names. Sometimes plants will go by multiple common names. And if you want to be sure that you're getting the accurate species, you want to look for it by that scientific name. Okay, thank you. Um, there were two questions on hell strips. One, you showed a picture of a hell strip with a tree planted in it. And the question was, what is the tree? And the second question was, if you are gonna get rid of grass in the hell strip near you, what would you plant there? Okay, um, one video that I forgot to mention is um, listed under the inspiration section of your handout. It is, uh, was put together by the head of our public education team, Amy Crumpton, and it's called Sustainable Landscape Basics. And in that talk, she gives an example of um, some median strips or, or hell strips. I, I'd have to go back and look at that slide, but I think it might have been um, a maple tree in that hell strip. Um, I tend to think of hell strips as a little narrow for the, the roots of trees that are gonna get tall. I've found in my neighborhood, the county is tending to plant um, either downy uh, service berry, Amelanchia uh, arborea, uh, fringe tree, mm. Cyanthus virginicus. Those are two that are, that are really uh, petite understory trees that I think are going to do maybe a little better in that, in that hell strip. Um, I've seen some people planting uh, flowers, you know, herbaceous plants as tall as three feet tall. You could do some grasses. Uh, if you're concerned about a feedback from the neighbors, you might just want to look to some of the, the mat forming plants, the lower 
growing plants. And um, you could look at the video that I created, Selecting Native Plants for Your Home Garden, which I also mentioned at the, on the second page of the handout as uh, for some suggestions. I, I think I actually introduced some Hellstrip plants there. Another okay. video that I meant to mention back in the section on introducing trees was another one uh, that was prepared by, by Amy Crumpton. And that is on the first page of the handout. It's called Native Trees, Selecting, Planting and Transplanting. And it gives very important guidelines for how to make sure that you have the right amount of space for the plant, both sideways for the roots, height-wise uh, when you're concerned about roof lines and uh, utility lines, um, and, and important information about actually how to go about planting them. So I highly recommend that resource from our virtual classroom as well. Thank you. Um, a couple of people uh, wanted you to talk about crepe myrtle and whether it's okay to use or um, how you feel about that? Okay, uh, <laughs> when I first uh, planted my backyard, I was very taken with crepe myrtles and I put in three of them, one each of three different colors. I have since regretted that. Um, I, they are not native. I find that they're right on the borderline of being invasive. In my neighborhood alone, just up and down my street, I've seen the seeds carried. Quite often they will land right on a fence line and they will grow up on either side of a fence. It's very hard for people to remove them. Maybe people who don't, aren't aware of what they are, don't remove them. And, and then they continue to, to spread and, and take over. And unfortunately, even have, after having removed mine, I continue to see sprouts as, as deeply as I dug to remove them. I think there are so many attractive native trees. Now they don't, they aren't gonna bloom at the same time as the crepe myrtles, but uh, something, well, the, the trees that I mentioned already, the, uh, the service berry, the fringe tree, the, uh, the Eastern red bud, our native dogwood, those are, are beautiful as far as the flowers, and they're going to be much more beneficial for our uh, <clears throat> pollinators. Okay. Um, someone asked how to best add canopy trees to an area that's already well shaded with understory shrubs. Okay, uh, again, I'd refer you to, to um, Amy's video. Uh, I guess what you would have to do is actually bring in trees that you want to be canopy trees, but maybe of a smaller stature. In fact, Doug Tellamy makes a big point about this. He compares trees that were brought in large with in his on his property, just allowing an oak tree to sprout from an acorn. And in a relatively short time, it, uh, it has grown up and equaled, if not surpassed, the, the trees that were brought in at a taller height. Uh, this particular tree that I've made mention of several times, this black gum was brought mm -hmm. in maybe at four to five feet in height. And, and now it's maybe 15 feet tall, just within a, a year or so of, of growing. So um, I think if you, if you, cite those carefully. Um, and you could always call in either someone from the Audubon at Home program, uh, one of their ambassadors, or consult with a professional arborist, get the best advice about how to very safely uh, plant and introduce those trees in between your, uh, your lower level trees. Okay, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions about rabbits and deer. Um, but they are <laughs> they they are a, a perpetual problem. Uh, when I first installed a lot of my foundation plants, I had rabbits actually nipping off entire three foot branches at the base, and I I was in tears over that. I ended up uh, creating individual. Uh, protective barriers of chicken wire around each of those. 
They were not very attractive, but after a couple of years, the, the thickness of those um, sprouting stems was substantial enough that the rabbits wouldn't be able to, to chew through those. So that's uh, a recommendation there. I've tried sprays, but the problem is when a big brainstorm comes, those get washed away and you have to constantly reapply those. Um, there are certain plants that are more resistant to, to deer than others. Uh, plants that have thorns and, and a, a prickly texture are, are less a, appealing. Those with um, an aromatic quality uh, that isn't going to taste good may be less appealing. But as our, uh, as our uh, expert, uh, Kirsten Conrad, uh, our agent always says that there is no plant that will be safe from deer at some, at some point. Uh, it could be that adult deer may not eat some of those plants, but a young fawn that, that doesn't know any better may take a, a sampling taste of something for the first time before being repelled. Um, later on in the year, I'm actually going to give a presentation on what I'm calling deer resistant plants. But uh, if deer are a problem, it, it really is a challenge. Okay. Um, Elaine, four or five people have commented that they're having trouble with the links on the handout. And I just put in the chat that you'll check that. And if need be, you'll send out uh, an amended one. Yes. Okay. Yes, I will. And I think that's it for the questions. You're going to be very pleased, I think, to see all the comments in the chat about how this was the best presentation people ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. And that it's like been so worth their time and uh, they just loved it. So that'll be fun for you to read, I think. And we all thank you for it. You're, you're very welcome. Happy gardening, everyone. And please feel free to reach out if you'd like uh, answers to further questions and look for the recording, the captioned uh, recording and this addendum document with any corrections uh, to those links uh, within uh, just about two weeks.